Hi, church family. Say hi, Peyton. Hi. <laughs> We're hoping that you guys are inside your stand safe today and are excited to worship with one another. Yes, I know that it is sad that we can't gather together today. And, you know, because of everything that's been going on and the spikes and things, it just seems to be best that everybody just kind of stay home. But it is exciting that we can, at least with modern day technology, worship together today. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So if you haven't yet, grab your Bible. Peyton, are we ready to go? Yep. We've got our Bible. We're ready to go. So if you haven't grabbed your Bible, get your pen and your paper ready to take notes. Hopefully you've been warming up your vocal cords and getting them ready to sing with one another. We're going to have a great time worshiping together today. And to start things off, we're going to go ahead and we are going to open with a prayer and invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Are you ready, Peyton? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask that you take this time that we've set apart today and make it yours, God. Lord, I pray that you just come in and that you fill the room, the space, wherever everybody's worshiping today, God, and just fill it with your Holy Spirit, God, that we can feel you, that we can know that you were with us, God. Lord, we ask you to bless this time, ask you to bless the time that we are spending together. Even though we're far apart, God, Lord, unite our spirits in one so that we can feel your Holy Spirit working through and among us, God. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit moves us in such a way that we can just be moved in our lives, God, to share you with, with people, with one another, and... um that your kingdom can truly be furthered through what, um, through really our lives and that we live. God, again, we ask you to show up and shine through the songs that we sing, through the scriptures that we read, through the prayers that we say. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus. And in his name we pray. And we said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's get started. There's a peace of come to me, though my heart and flesh may fail. There's an anchor for my soul. Can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is so well. The victory is won. He is risen from. Oh 
nothing holy more. communion, I want to read you the first five verses of Psalm 103. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me and we'll go ahead and get started. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And I'm just going to stop right there. Bless the Lord for all the good that he's done for us. And as we look at what God's done for us, obviously the greatest thing he's ever done for us is give us his son, that regardless of anything that we've done and how terrible we are in, in the shortcomings that we have and the sins that we commit, still decided out of the love that he has for us to die on the cross for us. So today for communion, I want to do something a little different. I want to take some time and reflect on the goodness of the Lord. And I think we just need to do that. The things that we're thankful for, those benefits, those things he's healed us of, you know, how he's crowned us with his love, um, how he's blessed our lives. And I just want to take some, some time and focus on that. So this part's going to be a little bit more interactive than normal. What we're going to do is, is that we're going to get the emblems, get the stuff ready, but I want you as a family or, um, 
you as as friends, whoever's there with you, I want you to go ahead and pause the video. Don't pause it just now, but I want you to pause the video. I want you to get all of your emblems ready, the, the stuff that you're going to be taking for communion. <clears throat> I want you to read the rest of the psalm together. It's a fantastic psalm. It's great. It continues on with what love God has for us and shows the contrast that no matter what we do, his love is still greater and that even even in our shortcomings, he still continues to bless and love us um, throughout it all. And read that and then share with one another those things that you're thankful for, the things that God has blessed you through and with and, and all of that, that, the circumstances that he's brought you through. And obviously looking to what Christ has done for us. It's amazing and it's awesome. So I just want to take some time today and, and do that. So go ahead, pause the video. It'll be ready for you when you guys are done. And you can go ahead and finish on uh, the service. So hopefully this something's a little different. Get you up off of the couch. Get you talking with one another. And um, hopefully it, uh, it ends up um, being a time um, that you can really uh, just you know, feel, truly feel God's love for us. So go ahead and um, try that now. Good morning, folks, and welcome to Christ Church Online Worship Service. We are glad you are with us this morning. On behalf of the eldership and the pastors of Christ Church and the leaders, I would like to say thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we are so glad that you are joining us. If I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times over the past few months, that flexibility is our best ability. And here we are again having to be flexible this morning. So much so to the point that I'm actually preaching from my home. Again, folks, we thank you at Christ Church for being patient with us, being kind to us, uh, for being very persevering with us as we navigate through these tough times. Due to the significant cases of COVID-19, cases in our area and our church family, the leadership has determined that in-person worship service is not safe at this time. And so we are uh, encouraging you to watch everything online for a period of time. We want to thank you again for being patient. Thank you for being so kind to us and understanding as we navigate through these difficult COVID times right now. We appreciate your understanding and we're glad you're with us. Well, let's move into the sermon this morning. The title of the message this morning is Enough. When is enough too much? Have you ever come to the point where you're at the end of your rope and you've had enough? If so, this message this morning is for you. First Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. When Ahab got home, that is home from the victory on Mount Carmel, he told Jezebel, his wife, everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And that is the prophets of Baal. Elijah was afraid verse 3, and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, to a town in Judea, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone. Now notice, Elijah is alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel, verse 7 of the Lord, came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, 
and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Now the Lord is going to speak to Elijah, the prophet of God there. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I really want that statement from the Lord to sink in today for us. What are you doing here today? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. And I, I am the only one left, he says. And now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there in verse 11, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, verse 13, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am, only, I am the only one left, he says, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel, the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. Then anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Molah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I have, and listen to this in verse 18, verse 18 yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Let's pray. Father God, today we thank you, Lord, for your love and for your kindness and for your mercies. For your mercies, Lord, are new every morning. Father, great is your faithfulness. And God, because you're faithful and good and kind, we feel good calling out to you. God, not only do we know you'll hear our prayer today, but you will answer our prayer. God, we know that you know when we've had enough, when we've come to the end of our rope, when we've said, God, I can't do it anymore. God, we know you are there in our weakness for us. That God, you meet us right where we're at, just as we are. And you come alongside and you aid us. Lord, we're so thankful for your holy word. We're thankful, thankful for these scriptures that encourage us and uplift us. And God, in a time like this, when we're dealing with this COVID-19, all the things that are going on in the world around us, God, we need your encouraging message today. We need a message of hope to lift us from despair. And so God, today I'm praying that you would illuminate your word, that you would bring it to light, that you would bring it to life that we might see your truths, God, and that your truths from your word might transform us into the image of Jesus. Lord, we need you. We love you. We do not want to take a step without you. Please be with us today, for we pray it all in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Popeye made this statement. You might remember Popeye. Some of you who have been around a little longer, some of you may not have any idea who Popeye is, but Popeye the sailor man made this statement. That's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. He was at the end of his rope. He didn't know what to do next. What do you do when you finally come to the point that you've had enough? That's all you can stand. In other words, you are at wit's end. I believe there are many people there today. This COVID-19 situation has stressed all of us out, including me. I thought we were going to be much further along now than we are, and here we've had to take a turn backwards. 
We're now not meeting in our church building. We're meeting in our homes again and watching everything live uh, as we look at, at, at life online. And I'm struggling with all of that. And I'm sure there are many of you struggling. Many folks, as we start to plan for the holiday, for Christmas, uh, we're thinking whether or not we're going to have family over. And all of this is stressing us out and it's causing problems within our lives. We've come to the point where we're at wit's end. Seasonal depression risk at an all-time high. This is the heading during a pandemic winter, says the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Listen to this, and I know you know this without me even saying it. As many studies have already reported, rates of mental illness symptoms in the population have been rising throughout 2020 due to social distancing measures, increased isolation, and a general upheaval of a of normal life due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For this reason, the prevalence of a seasonal affect disorder, SAD, is also projected to reach an all-time high in the forthcoming months as surges in virus cases coincide with declining options for activities as colder weather encroaches. Alongside the widespread multifaceted devastation caused by the pandemic, political concerns all around us, social unrest leave the American population increasingly vulnerable to SAD this fall and winter season. But see, here's the truth. You don't need a group of doctors, physicians telling you this. You know this. You see it all around you. People are dealing with heartache, hardship, sadness, despair all around us. Many people today can feel just like Elijah. They are struggling with discouragement. This pandemic has taken its toll on all of us. So if you're feeling discouraged today, let me say you're not alone in this. There is no temptation that has overtaken us that is not common to all people. You and I are struggling with this together. Discouragement can lead to depression and depression to despair. You can feel like you're in a black hole and you're spiraling down out of control. Or maybe you're just feeling sad and lonely today and confused. If that's the case, the sermon is for you. If that is where you're at, there is hope in the midst of discouragement. And it comes from the truth of God's word. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says for us in Romans chapter 15. Again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We who are strong must be considerate to those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves, says Paul. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ did not live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Now listen to verse 4 of chapter 15. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. Why were they written? They were written for our instruction. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. So there is hope this morning. There's hope that comes to us from the scriptures of Almighty God. How did Elijah get to this point? How did the man of God get so discouraged? That's the real question. Elijah was afraid, the scripture says, and he fled for his life. Now, I want you to get his situation in hand today. Listen to what the scripture says about Elijah. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there, so he's now all alone. He's afraid, he's fleeing, he's all alone in the wilderness. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and listened to what he prayed. He prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord, just take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors before me. So how did he get to this point? That's the question. How did he get so distraught in his life? Well, we have to go back in time to figure that out. We need to go back and take a look at King Ahab and the situation in Israel. 
How did Elijah get to this point? 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31 through 33 helps us out. Verse 31 says, And as though it were not enough, this is talking about King Ahab here, to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbel of the Sidonians, and he, became, and he began to bow down to worship Baal. First, they have built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. That was their capital city. Then he set up the Asherah pole. He did more to, listen to this. This is a statement about King Ahab. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any other king of Israel before him. Imagine if that statement was made about you, that you had done more than any of your contemporaries before you to make God mad. This is the statement that is made of Ahab. Because of King Ahab's idolatry, the Lord brought a severe drought on the land of Israel. It was at the words of the prophet Elijah that God said he would dry up the land. Elijah says this drought will not be over until I speak the word for it to be over. Because of that, King Ahab hated Elijah. He blamed him for the drought, and he sought after him to try to kill him. Now, where we're at when we come to this passage of Scripture is this major event that took place in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, and that is the confrontation on Mount Carmel. Elijah meets a servant of King Ahab, and he tells him, you tell King Ahab to come and meet me here to bring the prophets of Baal and meet me here. And the servant is terrified. He says, well, what if I do this? My master's been looking for you everywhere. I will tell my master you're going to be there and you don't show up. My master will kill me, he says. Elijah says, you can count on me being here. And so he goes and he gets King Ahab and he brings him to him on Mount Carmel. And so the prophet Elijah says to the people, how long will you falter back and forth between two opinions? If the Lord Jehovah, if Yahweh is God, then serve him. If not, then serve the Baals. But you need to choose. And so he sets up a challenge that day. And the challenge is this. The prophets of Baal, you go get your oxen and you set up an altar and you call on your God and you see if he will answer by fire from heaven. And I will do the same. I will call upon Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty, and see if he answers from heaven. And so he has the prophets of Baal go first. They built their altar. They lay their sacrifice on there, and they begin to cry out to Baal. Even to the point that they began to cut themselves, and blood was gush gushing and flowing all over the place. But Baal didn't listen. It wasn't long before the prophet Elijah began to make fun of them, to criticize them. He says, speak louder. Maybe he's off in a distance somewhere on vacation. Maybe he's taking care of his needs. Cry out louder. He began to make fun of them. This went on for hours. And after a certain period of time, Elijah then steps in. And he begins to speak to the children of Israel. He begins to say to them, come on now, let's build this altar together. And he puts 12 stones together. And he cuts the oxen and he lays them on there. But before he calls on the fire from the Lord, he has them bring pots of water and pour over the sacrifice and dig a trench around the altar to the point that water was just gushing and flowing and filling the trench. And then Elijah calls on God to bring fire down from heaven and accept the sacrifice that he has made before him. And God answers that prayer. And fire comes from heaven and it consumes the sacrifice. And the water is just like sucked up and drawn up. And the people said, the Lord God, he is God. And it was a great victory, wonderful victory. Elijah says, bring the prophets of Baal here. And he kills all those prophets. And then he looks at Ahab and he tells Ahab, it's time to party. Now I'm paraphrasing that, but it's time to eat and drink and be merry here. And he goes off and he begins to pray. He says, I hear the sound of rain. Elijah prayed and he told his servant, 
he said to watch over the water and, and look. And then a cloud started to rise out of the water. And he told his servant to go tell Ahab, you better go fast in your chariot or you won't make it for the storm that's going to happen. And then Elijah tucked his robe in his belt and he took off running and he ran ahead of Ahab. Elijah's expectation here is tremendous. He believes that now the people of God are going to turn to God. There's been this great victory. Everything that he was looking for, he thought, man, this is just a great event. Ahab is going to go home. He's going to tell his wife that the the nation of Israel will turn from their sins of idolatry. And this is going to be a great victory for God. But just the opposite takes place. King Ahab gets home and talks to his wife, Jezebel. If it is possible, as bad as King Ahab was, Jezebel was even worse. She was horrible. And she said, you tell Elijah that I am going to make him just like one of those prophets he's killed. I'm going to take his life and kill him. And Elijah flees. Elijah's hopes and dreams for the nation of Israel have been crushed, destroyed. They were no better now in Elijah's mind than they were before what had happened on Mount Carmel. And the prophet had got, prophet of God had come to the point that he said, I've had enough. I just want to die. I want it to be over with. Take my life, Lord. He was so discouraged, so distraught. Hear me on this. Thank God that he doesn't always give us what we ask for, but as his children, he gives us what we need. Elijah didn't need his life taken. What Elijah needed was hope. He needed comfort from God Almighty. And that's exactly what Elijah got from God. Here's our main idea and point this morning. When you say I've had enough, focus on the Lord God Almighty who is big enough to fix your condition in life. God is always bigger than any problem that you may have. This morning we're going to gain hope from the Holy Scriptures of God in three main areas as we focus our attention on God and not on our circumstances or who we are. When we struggle, we have to focus on who God is, what he knows, what God does, and what God says. Our sermon only has three points to ponder today, but they are important points to help us overcome discouragement in our lives. Number one, when you say I've had enough, Focus your attention on what the Lord God Almighty knows. Let me say that again. Focus your attention not on what you know, but on what the Lord God Almighty knows. What can we tell from this passage of Scripture about what God knows? Many things. Because quite frankly, what God knows is much more than we know. We never have a complete picture. Our picture we have is always limited knowledge, limited resources. We become discouraged. Why? Because we start to have a conversation with ourselves, about ourselves, about our situation, and we discourage ourselves. We have limited knowledge. We need to get a new perspective on life. That is a godly perspective. So we ask the question, not what do I know, but what does God know about this? Here's what the Lord knows. The Lord knows exactly where Elijah is right now. He knows Elijah's physical location. He knows Elijah's mental state. He knows Elijah's physical state. He knows the prophet Elijah's spiritual state of mind, doesn't he? This passage of Scripture deals with all three of those. You've heard me say before that God is triune. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're triune as well. We are soul, we are body, flesh, and we are spirit. And God deals with all three of those in this passage of Scripture. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. The Lord knows what Elijah thinks is truth about the situation. In other words, he knows what Elijah's thinking. Even before he says it, he knows what he's thinking. He knows how Elijah sees the situation. 
The Lord knows exactly what's going to happen. In other words, he's in charge. The Lord God knows what God is going to do. The Lord knows how all this is going to end, including what Elijah will do. The Lord is not going to panic, folks. He's never going to panic. He's never going to be afraid of what might happen. He's in charge. We know that from this passage of Scripture. And we also know the Lord knows Elijah loves him and that Elijah wants to serve him. No matter what's going on in your life right now, God knows your heart. He knows you love him. He knows you care about him. And he knows you want to serve him. And now you and I know that even, and this is an important point, even good and godly people, men and women of the Lord, sometimes struggle in life and become discouraged. Elijah became discouraged, and Elijah is a man of God. Sometimes people who love the Lord become discouraged and depressed. Sometimes even godly people can feel hopeless and helpless in life. And if for no other reason in this passage of Scripture, we should be thankful that God reveals this to us. We should be thankful that God did not end this story of Elijah with what transpired on Mount Carmel. Because we would have looked at this and said, Elijah's a superhero. We can never be like Elijah. But the scripture is different, isn't it? The scripture says that Elijah was a man just like us. He was just like us. A normal person. The Bible heroes are not superheroes. They're not folks that we can't be like. They're folks we can be like. See, just the opposite is true. They are people just like us. God knows. He knows that we have faults and problems and issues. And he loves us anyway. Praise God that he can use folks with faults. I want to say that again. Praise God he uses folks with faults. As a matter of fact, if God is going to use folks at all, he has to choose from people who have problems. There are no other people but people who have problems. So God has to choose someone who has problems if he's going to use people. But we must focus on what God knows, not on ourselves. When you say I've had enough, focus your attention on what the Lord God Almighty is doing. Not only what he knows, but what he's doing. The first thing that the Lord God Almighty does is that he meets the prophet Elijah right where he's at. Hear me on this. God is there in our weaknesses. We actually learn from the scripture that when we are weak, we can be strong in the Lord Jesus. Remember the old hymn, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. God accepts us and receives us just as as I am. But he loves us too much to leave us there. Notice he provides for the physical needs of the prophet of God. God sends an angel to give Elijah food and water. Why? Because we are physical beings. We have spiritual needs, but we also have physical needs. When you are, you and I are hungry, we call it hangry sometimes. We're so hungry, we're angry. When, when we're hungry, it's hard for us to hear God and to focus on God. Notice God provides the means for him. He provides food and water to take care of his physical needs. He provides rest for him. He's got a broom tree to sleep under and God gives him rest by letting him know God is taking care of him. Elijah's got a big journey ahead of him and he's going to have to be well fed, well rested and ready for the trip. And God has provided a place for him to be able to rest and be protected and the food he needs to sustain him. Oftentimes when people are struggling with depression and other things in their lives, when they come in and talk to me, I will ask questions that sometimes seem strange to them. I'll ask questions like, well, how have you been sleeping? Are you getting rest? I'll ask questions about their diet. What's your, what's your diet like? What have you been eating? What you eat matters. Whether you get rest matters. Yes, I know you are a spiritual being as well, but you're also a physical being. 
And all of these things, diet, exercise, rest, all of these things matter. And they will affect us spiritually. There's no way to keep this equation from happening. We are physical beings. We are also spiritual beings. And we're also soul, the psychological aspect of it. And all of that has to be healthy. And God deals with all of those aspects with Elijah. God is moving Elijah into an encounter with him. But first, God is dealing with Elijah's predicament right now. He needs food. He needs water. He needs rest. And God is providing all of it. And now God is going to also change his perception about things. God is going to change Elijah's perception. His outlook will determine then his outcome. When you say, I've had enough, we need to focus our attention on what the Lord God Almighty is saying. Not only what he's doing, not only what he knows, but what is he saying? What's God saying to us? He wants us to know what he knows. He wants us to see what he does. And he wants us to hear what he says. Elijah goes in the strength that God has given him to Mount Horeb or to Mount Sinai, which is the mountain of God. When we talk about the mountain of God, it is representative of going into the very presence of God. That is where God wants him to be. Oftentimes people will run from God. God is wanting them to run to him, not away from him. When you're discouraged, run to God. God is the one with the answers. God is now giving Elijah new information, new data that Elijah didn't have, which is giving him a new perspective on life. The Lord asks Elijah a question. The Lord speaks to Elijah and he says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah then gives to give God, he begins to give God a bunch of excuses. And truly he feels these are truth. This is why he is at the mountain right now. Because of everything everybody is doing, he's at this mountain right now. And God says, why are you here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Elijah has the perspective of a victim. Now, it may be true that he is indeed a victim because of King Ahab, because of Queen Jezebel, because of the people and their idolatrous behavior. It is true that maybe he is a victim. But see, you and I must never have a victim's mentality in life. This victim's mentality will destroy you because it looks at everyone else. I am what I am because of everybody else. I am where I am because of everybody else. I did what I did because of everybody else in my life. That's a victim's mentality. And that will never lead you out of discouragement and despair. It may be true that you are a victim, that others have hurt you, But you can't have that mentality. You can't take that position in life and give that power to others to keep you from taking personal responsibility, to correct the situation you're in right now. You'll be stuck there if you blame it on everybody else. Here's the truth. Guess what? If the devil brought you to this place, the devil's not going to change who he is. If people have brought you to this, they may never change. Your circumstances may never change. But God can change us. We are victims from time to time. But we must never have a victim's mentality. God gave him new information, the truth, that he was not alone, that there were 7,000 others that had not bowed the knee to Baal. He may have felt alone, but in truth, he was not alone. The truth is God had resources he knew nothing about. God always has resources, folks, we know nothing about. God is greater and bigger than any circumstance we have. What are you doing here, Elijah? God is not asking this question because he doesn't know. God is asking this question because he wants Elijah the prophet to fully express what he's dealing with. He's wanting to have a relationship with the prophet. God wants to hear his complaint. God wants to hear what's really on his heart. 
That is why God gives us such rich expression of this in the Psalms. Have you ever wondered why the psalmists say the things they say? They are raw before God. They pour out their emotion, their feelings, their discouragement, their hardships. They give it all to God. But then they listen to God for the truth that will transform their lives after they give it all to God. God really wants us to give our discouragements over to him by sharing it with our heavenly father. But then we have to allow our father from heaven to give us a different perspective about everything we think, everything we believe. It's okay to pour your heart out to God, but after you do that, you must listen to what God says later. You must let the truth of God change what you feel, what you think, if you're going to have victory over discouragement in your life. Elijah replied, I have been zealous to serve you, Lord God Almighty. The people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. And I just love this passage of scripture because the Lord tells him to go out and to stand before him on the mountain. And he says that he brought a strong wind but the Lord wasn't in the wind. He brought an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. He brought a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, God doesn't speak to Elijah in the windstorm. God doesn't speak to Elijah in the earthquake. God doesn't speak to Elijah even in the fire, although he could speak to Elijah through all of those. And sometimes he does that in people's lives. He speaks to them through those magnificent, marvelous, huge, dramatic events. But oftentimes what God does is that he speaks with a gentle whisper because that was what Elijah needed to hear. And more than that, that was what Elijah would respond to. Here's the truth. Elijah says, God, I'm not done with you. I have a mission for you. I have work for you to do right now. Here's the truth. Where you're at right now, you're at because I am the God of your life. All of this has been brought on you because you've been my servant. This hasn't happened because you've done something wrong. This has happened because you've lived the way that I've asked you to live. And because you're my servant, you're in the situation you're in right now. But I don't want you to worry about it. I don't want you to struggle because I am here for you in the midst of your weakness and I'm not done with you. The Lord tells him to go back the way that he had came. Isn't that amazing? He had run from where the Lord was taking him. The Lord says, you need to go back from where you've come. When you arrive there, I've got work for you to do. You're going to appoint someone king. You're going to look and you're going to get a friend to help you. Another prophet of God by the name of Elisha. Here's God's prescription for Elisha or Elijah. I have a mission for you. I have a friend for you by the name of Elisha. You're not going to have to do this all by yourself in this ministry. You're not all alone. I know your predicament. I know your perception. And now I have a prescription for you. This will be what you need to take to change your life. I will give you hope and encouragement by changing your thought process about this. When you say, I've had enough, focus your attention on what the Lord God Almighty knows, what he does, and what he says. We have to focus our attention on the Lord and not our condition. Let me share just a couple things with you as we wrap up today. One last point I want to make. The prophet Elijah had become good at making excuses. When you and I get good at making excuses, you then become good for nothing else, says Pastor Chuck Smith. And I agree with him. I believe God is shaking up the things that can be shaken so that only the things that remain, which cannot be shaken, remain. God gave Elijah work to do because God wasn't finished with him. And I don't believe he's finished with Christ church either. I believe he's using us today. We are here in the situation we're in today because God is allowing it. What are you doing here in this situation is the question. What are you doing here today? I really believe God wants us to focus our attention on him and not on our circumstances. 
As I've thought about all that's going on right now, I've got to tell you, I've been very discouraged. Discouraged because I'd like to be in the homes of people. I'd like to be sharing the gospel more. I'd like to be getting out there. And the Lord kind of laid on my heart the Apostle Paul. And I think about Paul when he was in prison. I think about how, how Paul looked at those churches, those missionary churches he had established, and how he wanted to go to them and be a part of them, and how he wanted to share the gospel around the world and all parts of the world, and he's stuck in prison. But you know what? While he was stuck in prison, God laid upon the Apostle Paul's heart to write the prison letters that we read today. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those letters were written because the Apostle Paul was in prison. I thought about that and I thought, in this case, I am reaching people that I would have never reached had God not have given us this avenue of YouTube, Facebook, preaching online. It's possible preaching online that I'm preaching to many, many, many more people than I would have ever preached to just from the podium at Christ Church Building. God has given us an opportunity to reach more people with the good news of Jesus. And for this, I am thankful. When you and I get busy doing God's work, it is amazing how we begin to get over the discouragements of life. Maybe even today, listen to me on this. If we would get busy for God, maybe we'll find a sense of purpose in life, a reason for our living. It may be that our discouragement will leave us as we get busy for God. Maybe today, if we decide to get busy for God. Remember, God brought a friend into Elijah's life. His name, Elisha. Maybe today is the day we need to be a friend to someone. We need to call him on the phone. We need to send him a text. We need to let him know today how much we love and care for them. Maybe we can do some social distancing and visit outside. Maybe there are things right now that we can do. We need each other. God knew that Elijah needed a friend. God knows we need a friend. That's why he's established the church, so that we would build and edify and encourage each other, that we would spur each other on to love and to good works. We need friends of Christ in our lives. We need each other. I need you, and you need me. The leadership of Christ Church really wants to say thank you to our church family. Thank you for being so faithful in your giving. Thank you for being so, so kind and patient and enduring with us as we navigate through these COVID-19 uh, times that we live in. Thank you for continuing to give. We cannot do the work that we do at Christ Church without your support. We thank you for going online and giving. We thank you for sending your checks in by mail. We thank you for texting those offerings. We thank you for giving because your giving allows Christ Church to continue. We thank you for your great love for God and your great love for his people and your great love for the lost. I want to encourage you, continue to look to God, understanding what God knows, understanding and seeing what God does, and listening to what God says for your life. May God bless you and keep you until we speak again. God bless you.
a fountain for his praise. With his righteousness across your chest, salvation for your head. The belt of truth around you now, with the shield of faith in hand. And with his peace upon you, sword you keep, your covered head to toe. that you were uplifted by today's service. Paige, were you uplifted? Yeah. Yeah, me too. So, as we draw things to a close here, I want to really bring your attention to a few different places. Um, these are places where you can, uh, if you need to reach out to the church for any reason, uh, you've got information that you need to give us, prayer requests, um, you, you know, you need, need something, let us know. Paige, where can they let us know? Facebook, um, the website. What's the website? Um, ccbg.life. Lot life. And you can email the church or call the church. Call the church, 419-354-1176. Again, you can check out the website, um, and you can also... Look on our Facebook page. We'll be posting things. Um, we'll let you know when we'll be getting back to in-person services again, hopefully here soon. Um, even though I love interacting with you guys uh, through the camera this way, I would much prefer to see you in person. And I know Paige would much prefer to be in person too, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes. So as we close things out for the day, I just want to say thank you. Truly Thank you from not only me, but from the leadership of Christ Church. Thank you for just your continued support and for your giving. You have just been gracious. And it, it, it is truly humbling, um, the fact that you continue to give during this, um, during this time, um, you know, this, this hard time that we've had right now. So again, from the congregation, from the leadership of the congregation, thank you. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to finish things out with a closing prayer. So if you would, bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, thank you for being with us today. Lord, thank you for blessing our time together. Thank you for giving us an uplifting time that we can worship you. Lord, we just pray that we can take this um, message and what you've put on our hearts, God, and apply it to our lives, not just so that it's part of our lives, God, but that we can make it that it's part of other people's lives, that other people can see the Jesus in us 
um, and glorify you because it because of it. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your great blessings, um, your constant love that you give us. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus and what he did for us and giving his life, coming here to this earth and dying on the cross. We couldn't thank you enough. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Have a good day.